Hello everyone. In today's command video, we're going to be taking a look at a couple things that a few people were asking specific questions about over on uh, the Discord, as well as, you know, just kind of general tips that kind of make, make things a little bit easier for you to play. The first question I was getting was asking about using buddy lasers, or basically not self-lasing for laser-guided weapons. Uh, the good news is this is a mostly automatic process. The bad news is you have to make sure you have all the right pieces in place in order to do it. The second question came to do with active versus passive sonar, which we'll go ahead and take a look at in just a minute to kind of I have a little idea as what's going on. Again, some of this stuff will be kind of redundant if you've seen the sonar video, but at the same time, this is kind of a good way to go ahead and kind of look at it from another perspective. So let's go ahead and take a look at our current situation. So I have a crew down here. This is an infantry platoon, it's some US Navy SEALs. And if I click on sensors real quick, you'll notice that they have a different collection of sensors on board. We have a binoculars, we have an LLTV, we have an IR camera, and we have a laser designator. And you'll notice that when I left click on a particular unit, that you have this option over here where it says MCON window and sensors window, you'll notice that if I want to turn on the laser designator on this particular unit, I can click on sensors unit and I can actually come down here and make this active if I disable this checkbox here. The problem is if I turn on a laser with nothing to point at it, it doesn't actually do anything for me. So there's no reason in the world why it ever needs to do this. I'm mean, sure there is one, I just can't think of what it would be. I'm gonna go ahead and disable that checkbox, go ahead and hit unit base. So let's go ahead and take a look at what's gonna happen here. So I have an F5E Tiger II over here. This particular version here is a one that carries LGBs. In this case, it's a GBU-12. It's basically a Mark 82. It does not have the ability to laze its own weapon. So what we're going to have to do here is we're going to have to go ahead and use this crew to lock onto this target so that it has the ability to go ahead and see where it is. Now here's where it gets cool. As long as this particular aircraft has the ability to drop a bomb successfully and this guy with the laser designator has line of sight on the target, we are able to automatically deploy this weapon. Keep in mind this can work with aircraft, this can work with submarines I've seen, I've also seen it with shore craft and usually it can be done with other aircraft with built-in laser designation systems. So uh, let's go ahead and set up our attack run here. I'm going to go speed up to afterburner. I'm going to bring us to about 25,000 feet, which is a pretty good altitude to deploy these weapons. Whenever you're using LGBs, uh, you have to really, really, really remember that the LGB itself doesn't have unlimited vision range. It's not like when you play in DCS where you can drop an LGB from like 36,000 feet, which is absurd because there's no laser out there that could possibly give you enough reflection on the target to actually use it. So you can see for this one, this thing's valid up to 65,000 feet. But keep in mind, the sensor on the nose of this particular weapon might not be sensitive to 65,000 feet. So that's something you're going to have to kind of keep in the back of your mind. You also notice that if you look at the loadout for the F5, it tells you it's going to require buddy elimination, which just means somebody else has got to light it up for us. All right, let's go ahead and do our attack run here. So what I'm going to do for this first strike is I'm going to go ahead and do a manual launch. So we're at 25,000 feet. We're going afterburner, which, by the way, there's no reason in the world not to use afterburner unless you have limitations of range. I'm going to press Shift F1. I'm going to left click on our commercial container vessel, and I'm going to allocate two to the target just like that. Now keep in mind, we don't have ignore plotted course on. So I'm basically plotting the course by moving this one around. But keep in mind, the range for the LGB is pretty significant. At 25,000 feet, it basically has a five mile range vertically. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. Even though we'll be in range for the weapon, doesn't mean we can hit the weapon because of that limitation. It's slant distance. We have to keep, kind of keep that in mind. So now watch what happens. So my F5 is gonna come screaming across the fjord. It's going to get itself into range, and it's going to go ahead and drop its weapons. But the moment that it drops its weapons, watch what our little handy-dandy Navy SEALs team, by the way, they are in range of this particular ship with this laser, is going to go ahead and do in just a moment. So again, this thing's going to be falling basically vertically. Ah, there's the handy-dandy red line. This is actually an illumination vector. The other thing I want you to notice is the fact that only a single LGB was dropped at this time. So I'm actually going to grab my Tiger, and I'm going to do an automatic attack. I pressed F1 and left click on it. So this particular particular LGB is actually being guided by our little handy dandy rangers on the top of fjord here and it's going to go all the way down to the ground. Now of course when you drop from altitudes like that the particular weapon's basically going to be traveling vertically. It's actually pretty cool. Let's go take a look at it real fast. Yeah there it is. Yeah basically straight down. Bunk slams right into the hull of that particular ship. Now our little F5 is going to come around. This is an automatic attack this time. So look at that. Weapon deployed, and he goes ahead and gets the heck out of there and returns to base while that laser is being guided successfully by this particular crew over on this side. Looks pretty good. Bingo. Nice shot. So that's how to do buddy lasing. It doesn't matter what type of unit it is, as long as you have line of sight and you're in range. 
I'm going to say the engine range piece again because that's what people forget. Our laser designator in this case has an insane 10 nautical mile range on it, which is actually better than a lot of aircraft laser designators. And keep in mind, if you have clouds or fog, that can interfere with that capability. All right, let's go ahead and answer our second set of questions here. So I have a group of submarines. I have the Typhoon, which is an unbelievably big submarine, easily one of the biggest submarines in history. It's huge. And next to that, I have a Kilo, which is a little diesel, and it's a very, very lightweight diesel. I have the exact same setup over on this side. Now, what I want you to see is our little Typhoon here is cavitating at about 131 feet, that's shallow depth. Our Kilo on the flip side is at minus 357. It's pretty darn deep. And we've already identified a contact directly ahead of us. Okay, what, what kind of contact? Ah, we don't know what the contact is, but we do know that it is pinging us using active sonar. And if you actually measure this distance, you're talking almost 10 nautical miles away. We're detecting this target pinging us with active sonar. Over on this side, we don't notice anything unusual. So uh, let's go ahead and flip things around real quick. Now, you'll notice on this side of things, I actually have I, two identical ships. I have an Oliver Hazard Perry over here. It's a FIG-7, and he's sitting here pinging away with his active sonar. I have another Oliver Hazard Perry. This is, again, the same exact ship who's not using active sonar. Now, what I want you to observe is the fact we have already acquired the Kilo submarine over on this side, and this one has acquired nothing. You're probably sitting there going, okay, something's wrong here, because that makes no sense. It's the same submarine. I mean, active sonar doesn't block passive sonar, right? And the answer is, it doesn't. The answer is, look at the depth. This particular ship here, you'll notice when I left click on it, you can see that its underwater detection radius is there. When I click on this one, its underwater detection radius is gigantic. That's because this ship has the ability to use towed sonar. Towed sonar is sensitive underneath the acoustic layer inside the water. So in this particular case, I have passively detected the Kilo class because of its being deeper than the actual layer. This particular ship, you're going, why is he not get that ability? Because the water's too shallow to successfully deploy the towed ray. And as a result, he's completely incapable of detecting that target, which I'll go to God's eye view. It's literally right here in Cavitating all afternoon. So that means we're not actually going to be able to pick up these two submarines until they get within the range of the hull sonar. Now, if I speed this ship up, that's simply going to go ahead and make it so we can't hear anything to begin with. Now, where it gets really interesting, I'm going to go ahead and speed up time a little bit here. I'm just kind of tooling away. I'll show you guys eye view so you can see this very clearly. Notice the ship that's above the layer is still completely undetected, even though it's completely cavitating. It's also a much noisier thing. Now watch what happens when we get just a teeny bit closer. Speed up time one more time. Go ahead and unpause real quick. You'll notice I instantaneously acquire the Akula now. Now under the Akula, it's a I believe, no, it's not a cool, I'm sorry, this is the Typhoon. So this particular ship identified it as it entered its passive sonar range because this particular submarine was above the acoustic layer. Now the cool thing is if I actually switch back to the other side real fast, you're going to notice this submarine is still completely clueless there's something out there. However, our ship over on this side who's pinging away with this active intercept, basically I should say it's active sonar, is not detected anything and it's been completely perfectly identified. Of course, we'd have to surface one of these subs or pop up the periscope to get a visual identification on it so we'd actually know what it is. But you notice how he completely gave himself away. Whereas this one over here, relying completely on passive sonar, has already seen exactly where the, both of these subs are. Now, now, if this kilo were a little bit shallower, I wouldn't be able to pick him up until he's here, which would be well within torpedo range. Now, in the real world, what we can do is we can launch a helicopter to go say hello to one of these two subs, which is a spectacular trick. So now coming back over to this guy, he still hasn't detected anything. So I'm going to go ahead and speed up time a little bit. Ah, we've acquired something. Bing! We've instantaneously acquired this particular sub here. And again, that's because we've entered into the radius of the active sonar system, which now has that's this little arc here. Now can see this particular sub. But we can't identify it. We just know that it's a fast-moving goblin. So what I could actually do is shut off my active sonar and just listen in the water for it for a minute. Keep in mind over on this one, who's been using passive this entire time, our whole sonar has not been terribly successful at identifying this one. But because the total ray is so sensitive, we've had no issue identifying the Kilo, even though the Kilo is a very quiet submarine because it's a diesel electric. Now watch what happens here. I'm going to go ahead and speed up time a little bit. So of course what's going to happen is the Albert, yeah, he's got to shoot a torpedo in the water. I knew he was going to do that. He identified the Typhoon and sunk it. Now notice 
we're still having no issues at all tracking this particular sub over here with our conventional hull sonar. Again, this is just using active sonar. We have a very precise measure on it. But look at where the kilo is. The kilo is sitting here two nautical miles away and is still not had the ability to be identified by this particular ship. It's completely clueless it's there because it's so deep beneath the layer. This one who's deep beneath the layer on the flip side is about to get a torpedo through its front windshield. Of course, um, most submarines don't have a front windshield. But notice, he hasn't even noticed that the parry is above him, which is, again, the danger that you have to be tremendously careful with that particular layer there. By the way, if you want to check your layer depth, you can just kind of hold your mouse over things, and it will tell you exactly where all that stuff is, so you can take a look at it directly. All right, we still have not detected that kilo. As a matter of fact, if you watch, it's going to sail right by us. That other kilo on the flip side just got a torpedo, and it's kind of gets sunk. Oh, it missed! And let's go ahead and pause. We never, ever, ever saw the kilo. So some of the things I want you guys to kind of take away from this, again, this is going back to what we did with sonar, is that that layer, that depth, is going to seriously impact your ability to go ahead and identify things in water. You can always identify what depth that a particular sensor is working on by taking a look at it itself. In this case, this is our toad array system. It's a very low frequency. Whenever you have this, you can always assume it's going to be under the layer. Hull sonar is always going to be shallower because it's connected directly to the ship. It can never see through that, basically, acoustic layer. So you have to be tremendously careful with that. Now, to make things interesting, I'm going to go ahead and turn around our Fig 7 here real fast. Go ahead and grab this one. Notice we've identified that ship, no problem, because of that stupid active sonar. I'm going to go ahead and bring us up to, let's say, just over the layer. I'm going to keep my speed relatively slow. I'll bring me down to creep speed there. Let's pretend we're sneaking up on this particular one here. So now our ship is uh, rotating aggressively because then obviously the baffles are going to block the sub from being able to hit, I should say, ship from being able to identify anything. Notice, by the way, with active sonar, you can't actually identify the target. You just know that it's out there somewhere like that. Uh, meanwhile, we got this guy over here who's sunk two subs without even being noticed, which is amazing. So now we're going to go ahead and grab this guy. Uh, we'll spin up. There we go. Check it out. We immediately were able to pick up that kilo when he popped himself back out of the uh, little depth zone there. Because again, he was going so low to the actual depth here, he was basically flying nap at the bottom of the ocean here. Now we're able to identify his direction, his speed, everything using this active sonar. Now if I were to flip off the active sonar, let's go ahead and do that now, you'll notice that I've lost that contact almost instantaneously. So if I want to be able to identify him, I'm going to have to get a heck of a lot closer to him. I'll go ahead and slow down to a creep. And let's see if we're able, able to actually identify that kilo. No, not even. Again, the reason we're having so much trouble identifying here is because of how shallow this water is. This water is 361 feet deep. That's it. This particular one right here, let's see how deep he is right now. He's only 131 feet. And we still can't pick him up on the active sonar because of the interaction below that shallow water. If we flip those back up to active, watch this. Bam, we got him again. So you can see where you would need to use those two applications. So one more thing I'm going to show you kind of uh, before we go ahead and let you guys loose that. <laughs> you can see my poor ship who got hit with the LGB earlier is uh, using helicopters for this purpose. Now, helicopters are sort of unique because some of them have what they call uh, dipping sonar. And this is something a couple people have asked me about. I really should have included this in the other video kind of dealing with ASW stuff. So let's grab that helicopter and move them over here. Again, the magic of the map editor real quick. And I'm going to go ahead and, uh, excuse me there, I'm going to move you out of the way. Get over there. Nobody likes you anyway. You make too much noise in the water. All right, so I'm going to grab my helicopter here. I'm going to go zip them over here. This helicopter has a couple really, really sophisticated tools for identifying things in the water. Let's go ahead and reduce them to minimum altitude, and let's bring them down to a hover. And while I'm at it, I'm also going to send a sonar buoy into the water just to kind of start listening around. Uh, we'll do a passive. We'll do it above the layer because we identified him at a relatively high level there. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, restore time there so that sonar buoy's in the water starting to listen. Now we've come to a complete hover. Now what we can actually do is right click on this helicopter and tell it to go ahead and start using its dipping sonar. When you order this command, this helicopter, assuming it has a dipping sonar, by the way, to check on that, if you actually click on the helicopter itself, you can see that it will have something that says dipping sonar on it. It has a relatively limited range on it, but it's absolutely wonderful. You want to make sure you're at a hover and you want to make sure you're at the minimum altitude. It's actually not minimum altitude. It's uh, a little bit higher than that. It's like 150 feet or something like that. Yeah. So now he's going to stick his dipping sonar directly in the water and he's going to start listening. But this is a common mistake 
mistake people make is that if he is set to be not active sonar, he will only use the dipping sonar passively, which is pretty effective. But if we absolutely had to guarantee where a target is, and we're not worried about getting shot down by basically a mast launched missile, we could actually safely turn on active sonar on his little sonar buoy. Now, what he's doing this operation where he's just kind of sitting here floating up above the surface of the ocean. Ah, we got him! You're going to notice that he has a timer of how long he has to sit in this position before he can move again. In this case, we've spotted our kilo again. We're going to go ahead and shut off the uh, sonar there. Again, that's the active sonar. One of the great advantages to this is the fact we can very, very precisely target something underwater without worrying about retribution. Mostly. Some modern submarines actually have the capability to carry SAMs on board that could actually engage our helicopter here, which is why it's important that uh, don't turn that on until the last possible second of the engagement. And keep in mind, this helicopter actually dips that sonar very, very deep. So even if this guy were trying to run very deep, which we'll demonstrate really quickly, look at that, we've identified him as a helicopter sonar just because of how uh, the noises is. I'm going to bring him to full cruise speed. I'm going to send him as deep as possible. Now, keep in mind, this a handy-dandy depth sonar hanging off the edge of this helicopter now. It deep, goes so deep, it may have the ability to actually acquire that. There it is. It was able to acquire the sub because it went so darn deep. Now, if we were extremely mean at this particular juncture, of course, we could land a Mark 54 right on its front windshield again, which we'll do in just a moment. Hello there, sir. Have two, please. We'll set him up to loiter speed, minimum altitude. He's going to speed up, and he's, he's going to go, oh, we got to wait until he's finished uh, deploying his tipping sonar. Oh, he doesn't care. Two torpedoes in the water. Now, this is actually really entertaining to watch from the 3D view here. Go ahead and call that up real quickly. And I'll zoom in a little bit. You can see uh, he's just sort of chilling. Uh, if anything, we can just send him back home. Go home. Uh-oh, pull up, pull up. And we sunk the kilo. Ha, ha, ha. So hopefully that helps answer some questions with active and passive sonar as well as buddy lasing. Uh, one other person was asking me, uh, they were saying something along the lines of, you know, what goes on with the sensors window. Uh, to be able to turn individual sensors on or off, you have to unclick the switch first. And of course, you can turn everybody on with one click, or you can turn everybody off with one click. And one of the things I love about this is it'll actually tell you the type of sensor right here. Anything that's got fire control radar on it, with a couple exceptions, generally it's kind of look, looking at the sky through a straw. It's very, very difficult to see what you're targeting. Like, for example, if we flipped on this air search radio, radar real quick, kind of give it a scan, you can see now that we're looking around here. We'll probably pick up that F5, although I'm pretty sure he got back to base by now, so we won't be able to see him anymore. Ah, bummer. Remember, anything that's active can be detected at about 1.5 times the range of the thing that's emitting. So you have to kind of basically balance your needs there before you go active. And again, it all depends on the situation. If you're in a terrible weather environment, passive sensors are basically useless up to a certain range. So you have to be very cautious with that. But again, hopefully this all helps you guys out and answers those questions that you had. Uh, the buddy lacing is kind of fun, especially if you have a whole like secret mission where you have to like drop off Navy SEALs and get them to a vantage point and then have them like laze like a ship or a shipyard or something. That's just fun mission making. But again, enjoy.